welcome to the Tapestry Effect. There are several different avenues of research to encounter upon our journey through Tatlow Court, including the history of the building itself and its owners, and the nearby and surrounding courtyard and gardens, which also supply us with some fascinating finds. Among them are an Anglo-Saxon burial mound, a graveyard and former church site, and a pond from which we see an intriguing reflection on the past. Since I am local to this incredible site, I thought it would be a great place to begin my journey of discovery. Firstly, we will run through some information on the building's history, and then look into the lives and works of the architects and chroniclers of its history. Right, so, let's go to Wikipedia. Have a little read out from there. <coughs> Teplow Court is a Victorian house in the village of Teplow in Buckinghamshire, England. Its origins are Elizabethan manor house, remodelled in the early 17th century. In the 18th century, the court was owned by the Earls of Orkney. In the 1850s, the court was sold to Charles Pascoe Grenfell, whose descendants retained ownership until after the Second World War. The court then served as a corporate headquarters for BT and subsequently for Classy Electronics. In 1988, it was bought by the Buddhist foundation Soccer Gokai International and served as their UK headquarters. The court is a Grade II listed building, and its present appearance is due to a major rebuilding undertaken by William Byrne for Charles Grenfell in 1855 to 1860. In the early 20th century, the court was home to William Grenfell and his wife, Etty. She was a noted Edwardian hostess, and Teplow Court became a gathering place for the souls, a group of, inter of aristocratic intellectuals. Pevsner and Williamson record the court's complicated history. Its origins are an Elizabethan manor house, which was reconstructed after 1616 by Sir Henry Galford. Rally. Let's see what Pevsner records on the complicated history. Oh, got the book here, 300 page book. Apparently it's really uh, very complicated. So here goes. Ascribed to Sir Charles Barry, an improbable attribution, 1855. Big early Tudor with gables and finials and an angle tower, the windows with arched lights, lofty square tower in the centre, under it the hall with two tiers of galleries, 38 foot by 16 foot in size, and in a bleak Norman style, the piers of polished marble. On the lawn in front of the entrance is a statue of a Roman emperor from the 18th century. The provenance seems unknown. That's it. Not very complicated. Doesn't really go into detail at all, doesn't actually tell you much. As you can tell from this, this is from the Heritage Portal from Buckinghamshire. Taplow Manor was based at Taplow Court. There was a medieval manor here, but it burnt down in 1616 and was rebuilt in 1635. This was subsequently enlarged in the 18th and 19th centuries to give us the Taplow Court we know today. Along with records of the manors, there are records of a windmill in the parish in the 13th century, water mills and a 13th century predecessor of Maidenhead Bridge that was replaced in the 19th century. The medieval St Nicholas Church was next to Taplow Barrow and parch marks can be seen in the grass during hot summers where the buried foundations remains under the grass. There are gravestones and tombs around the barrow from the old churchyard. There may have been a church here from the 8th century but the medieval example was built in the 12th. It also included some 14th century brasses, one of which dated to 1340, the oldest brass to a layperson in the country, in this case Nicholas of Amadon, a fishmonger. This and a 12th century font were moved to the new church when the old one was demolished in 1852. The church built on the current site in the 19th century was mostly replaced in the early 20th century. So you can see straight away that Pevsner who supposedly recorded its complicated history hasn't even mentioned the medieval manor uh, or the fire in 1616 and as we now will see from another website a bit more information on Taplow Manor I'll read this as you continue with the slide Taplow Manor which had been held by Ausgort 
A man of Earl Harold was assessed at eight hides, one vergate, in 1086, among the lands of the Bishop of Bayeux, with which it passed us on into western Turville, to the honour of Leicester and the Duchy of Lancaster. The claim of the officers of the duchy from the tenant of the manor was, however, resisted in 1500 on the grounds that Taplow was held neither of king in chief nor of his duchy of Lancaster. After the dissolution, the manor was attached to the House of Windsor, the connection being last mentioned in 1630. So again, he didn't mention that it goes back to at least 1086. I don't really understand that. Right, well, let's do a screen share with you guys. You can see what I'm looking at here. So here we have it. So it goes back to 1086. That wasn't recorded by Pevsner either. And at the moment, we're just looking at the architects, really. So actually, yes, this does go back quite some way. But at the moment, well, we're going to be looking into as it was mentioned here, Sir Henry Guilford. As it says, its origins were in Elizabethan Manor, which was reconstructed after 1616 by Sir Henry Guilford. Let's have a look. Right, so here I have found uh, there is some information on Sir Henry Guilford to do with Taplow Court. Here. All the lessees and stewards, however, gave up their interest before 1604 to Sir Henry Guilford, who in that year obtained a life grant of the stewardship of Taplow. 1610 and 1614, he was granted a lease of the site of the manor. It is probably the house referred to in 1616 as burnt to the ground. In 1630, Taplow Manor was bestowed on Charles Harbert, by whom it was sold in 1635 to Thomas Hampson. Sir Henry Guilford renouncing his rights in the site and fisheries about the same date. Okay, so there's a bit of information there about Henry Guilford, starting in 1604 and ending around 1635. Let's have a look at Sir Henry Guilford. Well, I did a bit of research, and this is the guy I came up with. I thought it was the wrong one. The reason for that? The date. He died in 1532, apparently, not 1635. So from here, it takes us to a page about Leeds Castle. And it says here, from the inventory taken in 1532 on the death of the constable Sir Henry Guilford, who had supervised the work. Really? Right, so he's done that in 1532. And then apparently remade Teplow Court in 1616. I don't think so. I think he was a bit dead by then, wasn't he? Who was he anyway? Let's have a little look into Henry Guilford. Sir Henry Guilford was an English courtier of the reign of Henry VIII, master of the horse, of course, and comptroller of the royal household. An ancient name in the Kingdom of the Royals. He was the son of Sir Richard Guildford. By his second marriage, his mother was Joan, sister of Sir Nicholas Vaux, the first Baron Vaux of Harrowdon. Okie dokie, let's have a look at Richard Guildford. Just to see where their family comes from. Was an English courtier who held important positions at the court of Henry the Seventh, including the Master of the Ordnance, British military. His father was John Guilford, the Comptroller of the House to Edward the Fourth. So, as you can see, all these peoples are very connected to royalty, but at the same time, as we noted, the timeline's completely out don't really get that. I thought that was quite interesting and thought I should show you guys that. And what else can we get from that? Okay, found that a bit interesting. So, who is Nicholas Pevsner? Who is the guy who chronicled 
the Taplow Court history in such an uncomplicated six sentence spurge, splurge in his book. Well, Nicholas Bernhard Leon Pevsner was a German British art historian and architectural historian, best known for his monumental 46 volume series of county by county guides, The Buildings of England. That's where I got my information. The Buildings of Buckinghamshire book. I actually bought it just to look at this and was unpleasantly surprised by the small amount of information. Anyway, who is he? Well, Nicholas Pevsner was born in Leipzig, Saxony, the son of Anna and her husband Hugo Pevsner, a Russian Jewish fur merchant. Very interesting. He attended at St. Thomas School, Leipzig, and went on to study at several universities. Okay. Some very interesting things about him, actually. Pevsner was more German than the Germans, to the extent that he supported Goebbels in his drive for pure, non-decadent German art. He was reported as saying of the Nazis in 1933, I want this movement to succeed. There is no alternative but chaos. There are things worse than Hitlerism. Sorry, that was a pretty poor accent. <laughs> okay. Further down the line. What can we find to do with that Hitlerism? Very interesting. I thought I had some more information there to show you. Can't quite think of it right this moment. But right, so he's a Brit German British art historian. Well, I don't think so. It's got no connection to Britain at all. Is it because of after the war? That he, uh, this bit here. According to biographer Stephen Gaines, Pevsner welcomed many of the economic and cultural policies of the early Hitler regime. However, due to Nazi race laws, he was forced to resign his lectureship in 1933. Oh, really interesting. So there's a link to Nazism there. Maybe they call him German British, as when he came here. Uh, here we go. Sorry about that. Pevsner was released after three months on the intervention of, among others, Frank Pick, then Director General of the Ministry of Information. He spent some time in the months after the Blitz clearing bomb debris and wrote reviews and art criticism for the Ministry of Information, Die Zeitung, The Times an anti-Nazi publication for Germans living in England. <laughs> he also completed, for Penguin Books, the Pelican Paper Book, an outline of European architecture, which he had been begun to develop while in internment. Right. Well, that's very interesting, isn't it? It's Penguin Books, eh? <sighs> I don't think they're really a trusted source, are they? So I can see quite an interesting little story there about Pevsner, who then became the writer and chronicler of architectural history, especially with the UK. And I can't actually believe he got away with writing so little about Taplow Court itself. Very strange. So for me, this guy's, you know, I'm not going to say that everything he's done is wrong, but there's so much more history here. Uh, he hasn't mentioned that it goes back and it's a medieval manor. He doesn't mention that there was a fire. He doesn't mention that it's mentioned in the Doomsday Book either. Very interesting. Right, well, referring back to here, let's have another look. The court is a grade two listed building and its present appearance is due to a major rebuilding undertaken by William Byrne for Charles Grenfell in 1855 to 1860. Let's have a look at William Byrne, William Byrne. 
William Byrne was a Scottish architect, a talented architect. He received major commissions from the ages of 20 until his death at 81. He built in many styles and was a pioneer of the Scottish baronial revival. Byrne was born in Rowe Street in Edinburgh, the son of architect Robert Byrne. He was educated at the Royal High School. Really? Oh, and what's this little section here? It has not been ascertained where Byrne became a Freemason, but he was the Grand Architect of the Grand Lodge of Scotland from 1827 to 1844, don't you know? When his pupil David Bryce was named as Joint Grand Architect, both served the Grand Lodge of Antient Free and Accepted Masons of Scotland, in that joint capacity until 1849. Really? Very interesting. Let's have a look at some of the lovely work of William Byrne. William Byrne. Some of his other architectural work, just to have a little look at who this guy is and what his work showcases. We start off at Cliveden. That's just down the road actually, so we're gonna definitely be looking at that soon. Some of the architectural works. Wow, what a garden. An absolute beaut. Fountain of love. Beautiful. Really is an incredible place. Some fantastic architecture. That's the War Memorial Cemetery. Don't want to go there. Very strange energy there. Okay. Just a few more shots from Cliveden there. Just showcasing some of his works. Wow, that's very old, isn't it? Hundreds and hundreds of years old, that one. A little shot of the gardens. And what else can we find here? Let's have a lovely look at all the lovely little buildings that he made. Helen's Tower. Doesn't look very old. Oh, he's built a mausoleum for his father's uh, burial. That looks pretty cool. Reevesby Abbey of Lincolnshire. Always makes you wonder there's something hidden there underneath. We find that when they put this sort of facade up here, it's usually hiding something. And you can see here a little garden wall around it. Just makes you wonder if the level goes any lower down. And as you can see, there's the verge there. Nothing that exciting, but you never know. Muckross House. Absolutely. Interesting place, but again, it doesn't look very old. It's, it does look about 1850s or something to me. I'd, what a stupid design for the door. What are they doing there? That doesn't look right, does it? And these lower windows. Is that the, you know, is that the bottom floor? Is that the original ground floor? As we're looking at into mud flood, mud flood, Muckross House. Ballantory Castle, nothing old about it, quite a cool building, you can tell it's quite a new structure compared to other architecture. Bangor Castle, see how they've built it up on the verge here, that always intrigues me as to what might be underneath. It looks to me like that section there is a bit older, but maybe it's just done in a slightly different brickwork. Not so interesting. Blerken House. Blerko and Castle, Ayrshire. Beautiful. Wouldn't be surprised if it's a remodelling, though. Stoke Rochford Hall. Taken from the gardens to the south of the hall before the devastating fire. Oh, another fire, eh? Very interesting. 
awesome building. Let's look at the history of some of these a little bit later at some point. Muckross House. That one's a lot different. Much more sort of Roman Greek type of style in a sense of the columns and and whatnot. Melvin Monument in St Andrew Square, Edinburgh. Coblame, Governor, we've got a muddy flutter. Just a drawing, but from the British Museum. Very interesting. Sand on Hall, eh? Hmm. I think I've just found that. William Byrne has just made some stairs up to the first floor, made a window into a door. I'd have just dug it out, I reckon. Ah, as we can see from this, yes, he did get the commissions to do lots of churches. Quite interesting. Ooh, look at the facade on Helen's Tower. Carl Lame, Governor, we've got another muddy flooder. A lot of mud, very high up. Interesting. Sand on Hall. 1852. Remodelled in 1852, I think. Still got quite a lot of the antiquity tech there. <clears throat> Probably taken some off. I always think the windows have been changed a bit. <clears throat> they don't look quite right. I reckon that building's just been remodelled. <clears throat> and another interesting thing is, as you know, under all of the windows, you do see other ones. Almost like a hidden layer. Was it mud flooded? Who knows? Could well be. Okay, so that's a little look at William Byrne and his brilliant work. Interesting to note that he's a Freemason. Also interesting to note here Again, as we'll read, uh, its present appearance is due to a major rebuilding undertaken by William Byrne for Charles Grenfell in 1855. Is that why, when Pevsner records it in his complicated history, he says, Ascribed to Sir Charles Berry. There's no link between the two. So, he's either getting it wrong, or Wikipedia are getting it wrong. There's no connection of the two. They're both around at the same time. Um, but it just seems to me that they're using them to, to, to fit them into the narratives of the timelines. As we saw with Henry Guilford, they've got that wrong. He died about 80 to 100 years before... Uh, the apparent revamp in 1635. And then you go to Nicholas Pevsner, who's recorded the history. Um, some very strange things about him. And the fact that he chronicled Charles Barry, uh, not William Byrne. Tutlow Court mentioned on Wikipedia, mentions William Byrne, who was a Freemasonic Scottish architect. So lots of discrepancies there for us to look through. And with that in mind, because of Pevsner's mention of Charles Barry, we'll now have a little look at who he is and what he's done. Sir Charles Barry was a British architect best known for his role in the rebuilding of the Palace of Westminster in London during the mid-19th century, but also responsible for numerous other gardens and palaces. Sorry, buildings. He is known for his major contribution to the use of Italian art architecture in Britain, especially the use of the Palazzo as basis for the design of country houses, city mansions and public buildings. Interesting. Born on 23rd of May 1795 in Bridge Street, Westminster, he was the fourth son of Walter Edward Berry, a stationer. He was baptised in St Margaret's Westminster in the Church of England of which he was a lifelong member. So a heavy connection to Westminster and, you know, some sort of royal connection. But this guy is uh, quite a lucky man in his early days. 
he was able to do a bit of travel and fit in some different styles. Barry was recommended to the church building commissioners and was able to obtain his first major commissions building churches for them. Very interesting. Sir Charles Barry. Okay, let's have a look at some of his work. This is where it can offshoot into another episode. He was also partly the architect for the Inner Temple in London. Very interesting look. There was a rebel, a peasant's revolt in 1381, during which the Inner Temple was largely destroyed. There's the arms of the Inner Temple and Charles II whom the Inner Templars welcomed back to London after the English Restoration. We're going to have to look into that on another episode. Here's the gateway of Inner Temple. A few shots, the gardens. Very interesting. That could offshoot into another episode. Harewood House. Wow, I think this is why they're at Harewood House, effectively. Look at the old castle. How awesome is that? That's on the lands of it, is it? Oh, but that's the new part, obviously. Not hiding under the verge there. Wow, what a building. A scene from the garden. Very sort of heartitarian looking. Incredible interior. Wow. Very interesting. That's very new. There we go. Look at that. <sighs> Unbelievable. Harewood House. Very nice. Now let's have a look at some of these. Look at that interior, very Tartarian looking. Very interesting. That was an interesting one. Look at this castle that he's been involved with. Reconstructing more than an actual architect, I believe. Does seem to have been commissioned for many, many works. Look at this. Have you noticed that most of these castles up in Scotland have uh, got a lot of hills hiding something underneath it? Very interesting. That bit's quite a lot older, I'd say, than that as well. See, that's obviously been remodelled. Got a different sort of architecture to it. Halifax Town Hall. Hmm. Seems like a bit of a strange design, doesn't it? To have the stairs leading up to the first floor. I mean, if it's near the sea or something, surely you wouldn't have windows down here, would you? Don't quite get that. I think that's a remodel of an old building, to be honest. Same building. Look at that. Look at the antiquity tech on that. Unbelievable. Incredible stuff. I, I, I can't believe that they'd have built that bit. Some of the interior from the council chambers. Wow, Highclere Castle, look at that. What a beaut. How unticky techy can you possibly get -y? Wow. Very interesting. Show me image blurs a bit there. Quite want to have a little closer look if there's any discrepancies there at the ground level, but anyway, let's move on. He was involved with the House of Parliament. Ew, yas, his finest work. Kingston Lacey House. What a beaut. Look at that. Again, they build the verge up. What's behind that? And also, as we've spotted out before, this facade. I swear that they add that later to hide things. 
I've seen that in a few places and on one occasion I've seen a picture of a building that's got this on it and then I've seen the older picture of the building that's not there and what do you see? low windows it's a mud flooder and they're trying to hide that that's a possibility so again very kind of Roman Colosseum -y bit there at this gallery in Manchester seems to me that they seem to fence them in and they've probably uh, covered up something that's lower than that as we've all been looking up for a while now Surgeons College Royal College of Surgeons of England <laughs> why is it so heavily gated eh? we've got some secrets to hide what's this the Pepperpot Tower Queen's Park Brighton very sort of totalitarian looking looks to me like they've just painted it white I mean would you not prefer to actually be able to see all the work there or they just come and painted it <laughs> I don't know it's a question for another time that one Trentham Gardens welcome to my lovely little garden Wow the grand entrance they obviously can't be bothered to use it anymore they're just leaving it dilapidating. Look at this one. Again, a picture of Trentham Hall. You can see how Tartarian that looks. That is unreal. What a building. And some gardens from Dunrovan Castle. Oh, there's one of the churches he obviously got commissioned to rebuild. Here. A section of somewhere where they've built and you can see different styles put together obviously that's newer and that's newer one thing I do question is this bit here I mean is that really part of the design or is it something else that they've covered up I'm not quite sure that's back to Cliveden so they were both involved with Cliveden were they Strange, because uh, I don't think they're both mentioned. We'll have to have another look at that at another time. Ah, this is where we can offshoot a little bit as well. So apparently it was involved with Corf Car uh, something to do with Corf Castle. Um, and look what it says here. Corf Castle was slighted by order of Parliament in the 17th century. Very interesting. Makes me think of a, a flood of mud or something coming in and dismantling it but actually slighting is slightly different to that but one second before I go on about that has that been melted onto it that doesn't look quite right does it surely you'd see the top of the brickwork there and as we've seen on a few other channels where you guys have mentioned that some melting that kind of looks like that's been melted on there and this wall obviously is you know been mucked around with so what is slighting let's have a look slighting is the deliberate damage of high status buildings to reduce their value as military administrative or social structures <clears throat> this destruction of property has seen sometimes extended to the contents of buildings and the surrounding landscape <clears throat> It is a phenomenon with complex motivations and was often used as a tool of control. Slighting spanned cultures and periods with especially well-known examples from the English Civil War in the 17th century. The English Civil War, the 17th century, ordered by the Parliament, really. Meaning a new slighting is the act of deliberately damaging a high status building, especially a castle or fortification, which could include its contents and the surrounding area. The first recorded use of the word slighting to mean a form of destruction was in 1613. Castles are complex structures combining military stuff, but we, we know that. Okay, well, let's have a look at the methods of destruction. A range of methods were used to demolish castles, each affecting the buildings in different ways. Fire might be used, ooh, like we've seen already, especially against timber structures. Digging underneath stone structures, known as mining, could cause them to collapse. Dismantling a structure by hand was sometimes done, but was time and labour intensive, as was filling ditches and digging away earthworks, and in later periods gunpowder was sometimes used. 
Manually dismantling a castle can be split in two categories. Primary damage, where the intention was to slight the castle, and secondary damage, secondary damage, which is incidental through activity such as retrieving reusable materials. Yeah. Mining involved digging underneath a wall or removing stones at its base. Yeah, that might be a bit accident prone. When successful, the tunnel cavity would collapse. Yeah, hopefully not on you, right? Making it difficult to identify through archaeology. Archaeological investigations have identified 61 castles that were slighted in the Middle Ages, and only five were undermined. While surviving mines are rare, one was discovered in 1930s during excavations at Bungai Castle. It probably dates from around 1174, when the owner rebelled against Henry II. So, as you can see from that story alone, the slighting happened here. It was ordered by Parliament. So, who do these castles belong to? Hmm? That makes me wonder. Sorry about that, that was a little offshoot, but again, we've come across some interesting information um, that we can go forward with, with hopefully some understanding as to what's happened in the 17th century. Um, with their slighting of 61 castles. Obviously, they're going around and stealing these places for themselves, aren't they? Anyway, back to the storyline of these architects and the works of Charles Barry, as we're on at the moment. So, Dulwich College is new buildings in 1869. Okay, it's just a drawing. Right, so these are all new in 1869, are they? Why don't I believe that for a flipping second? I've not seen that much antiki techy in one place in all my life here. Guarantee they're not there now, though, can't you? Or can we? <laughs> Let's have a look. Dulwich College. Well, there's two of the buildings. Where's that one? It's not in the picture. Or is it? Let's see. Actually, am I getting that wrong? D -d Interesting. Maybe take it from the other side. They've definitely missed something there. This is what I love. The Dulwich College heraldry badge. God's gift! Look at that. What have I got? Hold above everything else. A heart in their hand. A human heart. They hold the human heart above the fire of decadence. Don't worry, we've got lovely little floral flowery patterns too. Koblame, don't slip on our banana skin. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Duncombe Hall. Okay, it's not a great image. It's a bit blurry, isn't it? Now here you can see the full scope of it in a sense. There's three floors here, as you can see. And now, as you can see, in this supposed, oh no, yep, Duncan Hall, and Duncan Hall again. Now, it's a shame I can't see that any better. What I can tell here, though, is the third level that you see here in this picture is under the mud. Very interesting. In 1829, Duncombe Hall was a mud flooder. Again, a reclaimed building. So again, they're not completely architects. They're more renovators and refurbishers of places they've found that the royals are stealing for their own kingdom. Dunrobing Castle, as it appeared in about 1813, before later improvements. I like the way they put the cannons there. Just add that facade, don't they? Corblame, Barry's most famous building. The Elizabeth Tower of the Palace of Westminster. Athenian Princess Street, Manchester. Again. Hidden level. Door leading up to the first floor. Ignoring the ground floor. It's a mud flooder. It's an old building. But as you can see, they've worked on it quite a lot. That roof isn't even very old. Gawthorpe Hall. 
Not bad, not bad. A bit smaller than my house. Halifax Town Hall. All right. Again, we've built the street level up, ignoring the ground level there. As you can see from this shot as well, you can clearly see that much more as they've built the verge of the road moving upwards. They've been covering up some of that. Again, another good shot of it. You can clearly see the more the road goes up, the more these windows are hidden. What's underneath that as well? In fact, let's just very quickly have a look. Oh, what a surprise. Look, there's that lovely little crappy cementy facade thingy that they put there always to hide something underneath. And you know what I really love about this shot is it's modern and you can tell by the new building. God, God, where did they get their inspiration from, these people? <laughs> they completely ruined it. That's what you get a lot nowadays, isn't it? You get beautiful buildings, knock them down, and they put up an old piece of rubbish. A new piece of rubbish, sorry. Another church he did. Corblame, Kingston Lacey House. Extravagant style. Kingston Lacey House seems to have, for some reason, an Egyptian obelisk. Questions, questions, questions. Why? Interesting. Oh, we live so luxuriously in our lovely palace, don't we? There's Reform Club. Mm, again. Oh, look, what a surprise. Don't use the ground floor. Let's build stairs to the first floor. The lobby and some surgeons of the College of Surgeons. The Court of Examiners. What are we going to do with these bloody humans? Srubland Hall. And here is a picture of our Sir Charles Berry. Here I am with my opium pipe. Nope, uh, nope, it's a compass. I'm going to use this compass to just ruin this map of Tataria that I'm hiding under my elbow. Oh, are you surprised I'm not hiding my hand? Oh, I bet you are. Soton Hall. What a beaut. Kingston Lacey House, after the remodelling, eh? Oh, yes, they do keep remodelling so we don't notice the facade. Nice drawing of Sodden Hall. Dunrobing Castle. With the portion added by Charles Barry in the foreground. In the foreground. What? This bit? What? Jimini's added that? Usually when they do that, they um, hide the windows underneath, but they haven't done that. And in all honesty, it doesn't look majorly old, but it does look like it's been remodelled. Very interesting building. Like the old clock tower there, that looks really cool. Excellent place. Very nice. And a painting of showing Barry's fountains. Oh, absolutely brilliant. And Travellers Club London. Oh, oh my god, they haven't built up to the first floor again, have they? What's hidden under there? As we look through all the buildings that he made. Trenton Hall. Upper Book Street Chapel without a roof. And then nine years later with a roof looking really poor. Well, look, they're remodeling it again. So. Upon our brief look into the history of Tableau Court, its architects and chroniclers, we've been able to identify that there are several discrepancies. As mentioned earlier, Wikipedia announces Pevsner and Williamson record the court's complicated history. Firstly, Pevsner and Williamson co-wrote the book The Buildings of Buckinghamshire, detailing in just seven lines of writing the supposed complicated history, without mentioning the fact that there was once a medieval manor there, detailed as far back as in 1086 in the Doomsday Book. I'm certain that this site goes much further back than even that date suggests. There is evidence that suggests that there was an Iron Age hill fort here, Anyhow, the chroniclers then failed to also mention the fire of 1616. 
Pevsner also ascribes the building to Sir Charles Barry, whereas Wikipedia states that it was William Byrne, whom we then find out was a Freemason. How can the two be so conflicting? Surely it was one or the other. Did they work together? No, they did not. Upon further research, I can validate that they never worked together. We also see that Charles Barry had a major connection to Westminster, where he was baptised and then became a lifetime member. We also found out that he was later commissioned to do major church works around the United Kingdom. Was this more about remodelling and altering the church's resonances and downgrading them by possibly taking away the antique tech features of the churches? This is a question for another time, but worthy of note as a possibility. Wikipedia then further mentions that the court's origins are of an Elizabethan manner, but again failed to mention the previous medieval structure. Wikipedia also states that Taplow Manor was reconstructed by Sir Henry Guildford after 1616. There is then a further mention of him on the Heritage Portal website detailing his act in Taplow between the years 1604 and 1635. To recap and further analyse, it was written that in 1604, Guildford obtained a life grant of the stewardship of Taplow. In 1610 and 1614, he was granted a lease of the site of the manor. Then in 1616 it was burnt to the ground. Is that not a coincidence? Is he not then after named alongside it for its reconstruction? At this time also we must point out that the Taplow Manor was attached to the House of Windsor, beginning, beginning around 1541 under Henry VIII's Dissolution of the Monasteries Act, up until around 1630. This shows that the Crown was involved with the initiation of the Dissolution Act under Henry VIII, and it's supposedly Henry Guildford whom is the last person involved during the House of Windsor's stake in Tatlow Court before its sale to Charles Harbert, Charles Harbert in 1630. But we then found out that Henry Guilford was the comptroller of the royal household in the reign of Henry VIII, and died in 1532, 84 years before his supposed reconstruction of Tatlow Court. A completely obvious discrepancy in the timeline. His death in 1532 was then clarified for us on another page, mentioning his involvement at Leeds Castle, where he had overseen the works there. If Guilford did die in 1532, he would not even have seen the dissolution of the monasteries at a movement happen under King Henry VIII's reign, playing out between 1536 and 1541. If that's the case, he certainly wouldn't have been around in 1616 at all. But if the timeline is correct, then surely there was a deliberate move to lay the building to ruins. So what exactly are we to make of all this? I am led to believe that the Crown were involved in a deliberate fire that took place at the old manor, possibly involving Henry Guilford as mentioned. I do however realise the obvious discrepancies of the timelines involved and, be and believe that they have been adjusted and played with to fit their false narrative. Therefore there are many obvious errors in the detailed facts. There seems to be many major issues adding this whole story up. We then also saw from several of the photos featuring buildings from both William Byrne and Charles Barry that many of these buildings are possibly reclaimed after a reset, with some structures appearing to be mud flooded with stairs leading up to the first floor, which makes me believe that these buildings are a lot older than mentioned and have just been remodelled. We also further mentioned and noted that Pesma is mentioned as being German-English, however on closer inspection he was born in Leipzig, Germany to a Russian Jewish fur merchant father and mother named Anna. They failed to give any information, further information on Anna. I found out from another site later that she was born in Lutz in Poland. Perhaps it was when he became a British citizen in 1946 that he then was seen as a German Englishman. He was, however, quoted in 1933 as being more German than German and saying of the Nazis that I want this movement to succeed. There is no alternative but chaos. There are things worse than Hitlerism. However, he was then included in a Nazi black book as being hostile to the Hitler regime. According to Stephen Gaines, Pevsner welcomed many of the economic and cultural policies of the early Hitler regime, but due to Nazi law, uh, race laws was also forced to resign from his lectureship in 1933. He then moved to Hampstead in England. Further information on Pevsner reveals that in 1940, after being in internment in Hoyton, Liverpool, for being an enemy alien, he was released after a visit by Director General of the Ministry of Information, Frank Pick. He then went on to write reviews and art criticism for the Ministry of Information's Die Zeitung, an anti-Nazi publication for Germans living in England, which translates as The Times. 
perhaps that is why he was blacklisted by the Nazis, even though he was able, also known to support them. So he wants the Nazis to succeed, then ends up in their black book, moves to the UK where he gets on board the Ministry of Information through an intervention from the Director General of the Ministry of Information, then ends up writing anti-Nazi material in a country that's also run by a German family behind the scenes. He then goes on to rewrite English history. He also competed and completed for Penguin Books and Perkin Paperback an outline of European architecture which he had been developing during his internment in Liverpool, a three-month stay. He'd also been awarded with a doctorate years before in 1924 for a thesis on the Baroque architecture of Leipzig. In 1945, he began working on the Buildings of England books. In 1946, he assumed British citizenship and made several broadcasts on the BBC Third programme, presenting nine times in all before the 1950. All rather nicely timed. But what exactly does the Ministry of Information want with someone like Pevsner? And then he goes on to the BBC. Well, it's quite obvious that Die Zeitung is a propaganda tool created by the Ministry of Information. So at that point, he is on board the disinformation machine. Perhaps this, plus the reason he had been awarded a doctorate on Baroque architecture, led him to then write the Buildings of England book series. The publishing companies Penguin Books and Pelican Publications, both of which I believe to be very watered-down publishers, for mainstream, for mainstream consumption are also involved in the same game that both the Ministry of Information and BBC would be. Propaganda. Hence, this could also be the reason he has not detailed the facts of Taplow Court's history properly in the books of Buckinghamshire. It makes you wonder just how many other crucial facts went missing when Pezner revealed and released his volume of books. That concludes episode two of our visit to Taplow for the tapestry effect where we have fully concluded many discrepancies in the details of the history of Tatlow Court, its architects and chroniclers. Thanks for watching.